start making decisions with your leadership team, bringing them along and all the other forms of leadership, work through that cascade of communication, through your organizational structure to win people over to the vision behind the where and the why behind the what and the how. And that is going to lead to far better communication because it will be done through relationships of trust, not just the best ideas. The best ideas do not win the day if they're not seeded through relationships of trust. Welcome to the Huntley Leadership Podcast, helping leaders be a positive catalyst in the people they support, the organizations they serve, and the communities they live. This podcast will make you think, laugh, and grit your teeth with new determination to make your parish or business a place of transformation, passion, and purpose. If you're still breathing, you are powered for impact. Hello and welcome to the Ron Huntley Leadership Podcast. I hope you grab yourself a coffee, get yourself in a comfortable chair, get your notepad, and take some notes. Today, I want to have a conversation with you about six reasons people often don't get communication right. You see, in the coaching that I do, poor communication is, I bet you it's the number one issue that leaders bring up, bring to the forefront in terms of places they need help with, whether it's a parish or a whole diocese. People often complain about communication and not getting it right. So I want to break this conversation down into six topics or themes, and I'm not saying I'm necessarily getting them right. I think the very fact of having this conversation, addressing these themes, this will give you the opportunity to have these conversations with people that are important to your leadership structure to see if any of this stuff makes sense. And please write me back. Tell me what you're learning. Tell me what you agree with and disagree with, because I'm learning with you. I want to start by talking about the whole idea. For one, you assume that information is at the core of communication. I don't think that's true. And we're going to come back to that. What if information is not what's at the heart of communication? In fact, what if it was more about trust? What if it was more about connecting with people? Number two, announcing information or ideas to as many people as possible all at once is a good idea because it's fast and it's efficient. It might be fast. It might be efficient but it is a terrible idea. That's number two. Number three is once you communicate something, your duty is performed. Oh no, it's not. <laughs> the bigger the idea, the bigger the change, the bigger the concepts, the more time it takes to do it well, to facilitate change. Communication is only one part of facilitating change and just saying something doesn't mean that it lands with people in a way that connects with them. Number four, if people complain, you must be getting it wrong. I'm not convinced that's the case. We'll talk more about that because there are always going to be people complaining that they didn't know, they didn't hear, and your communication is bad, and I'm not sure that's the case. Number five, communication belongs to a person or a department. And so when we mess it up, it's their fault. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> a lot of people say, if I could only hire a communications person, then our problems would be solved. No, they're often not. You just have somebody you can blame. And I don't know that that's helpful. So we'll talk about that too. And everybody in the communications departments is now just saying, Amen. Hallelujah. Preach it. Rock. All right. Number six, it's the leader's responsibility to make sure that communication takes place. Well, I guess in essence it is. But everybody, or it's not uncommon for people to lump everything on the church or the staff or the pastor to communicate everything. And that's actually a terrible strategy. And we'll talk a little bit more about that too. So those are the six ways we're going to break open how people get communication wrong or why communication whack, communicating well can be so elusive. So stick with me. Let's go back to number one. You assume that information is at the heart of communication. And what I'm saying to you is I don't think it is. 
I think trust is at the heart of communication. You see, when we don't trust the person who's speaking to us, when there's a gap in information, we'll often look down. We'll often look down. We'll fill in that gap with a story that's not particularly complimentary to the person, the organization, the church, or the diocese that's speaking it. Why? Because we don't trust them. But when you do trust somebody and there's a gap in communication, you often have their back and think the best. So I would suggest to you that connecting with people, building a structure of trust, growing in an institutional competency is going to be a big part of communicate. Because if people don't trust you, you can say something to their face with information and they're not going to believe you because they don't trust you. So therefore, they're not hearing you the way you intend to be heard. Let's talk more about that. Um, my friend, Father, uh, who was that? Father Patrick shared a book with me the other day by Dr. Henry Cloud and it book was called Trust or five pillars of trust. I want to share them with you. You're going to want to write these down because they're really helpful. The first pillar of trust is care. It's hard to trust somebody if they don't care for you. Care is often expressed through asking good questions, listening to understand. That's often how trust is built. That's through care. So caring for people, ask good questions and listen to understand. When that happens, we begin to build trust with people that they actually care about. So that's pillar number one. Pillar number two is motive. Are you doing this because you have my back or are you doing this to, for some reason, get ahead yourself? Like what's your motive? Because if I can't trust your motive, if you're only doing what you're doing for your own good, for your own self-promotion, for your own self-grandizement. I can't trust that. I need to know that you have my back, that your motive is pure. So that is the second pillar of trust. Third pillar of trust is competency or skill. You know, you don't ask an alcoholic to help you overcome your drinking problem. Probably doesn't have the skills required to help you because he can't even help himself. And so skill is an important part of trust. If you're going to place your trust in an organization or a group and they don't have the competency to get the job done well, your trust is poorly placed. Number four is character. Does that person or does that organization exhibit the character that you can place your trust in? Do they do what they say they're going to do? Do they have a good work ethic? Do they show up on time? They, they make good moral decisions. Do they, um, when it comes to ethics, do they have good ethics? Do they have good character? If they don't have good character, it's really hard to place your trust in that person or that organization. And the final one is track record. What has their track record been? Because the best way to see how somebody will behave in the future is often to see how they've behaved in the past. Now, with that said, we can establish new track records, but we have to be intentional. Trust can be broken, but it can be earned back. But it can't be earned back because you say, trust me, if those five areas, if those five pillars aren't in good working order. And so I say that because when it comes to communication, what's your track record? Are you all over the place? Or are you, do you have platforms that you consistently speak into that people know they can go to uh, to get their information? Because if you're doing that, if you're consistent, that's helpful. When you communicate, do you just ask for things? Or do you communicate stories that show you're listening and show you care? Really important thing to consider. You know, if you're a diocese, oftentimes, and I don't mean to pick on diocese, I love working with diocese, but oftentimes diocese and churches are the same way. Don't plan ahead. And so then all of a sudden you decide you're going to do something. You spring it on people at the last second as if they have nothing else to do. And, and, and it messes it up. And, and so the competency, people question your competency because you're not planning ahead. And the stuff you're asking for isn't insignificant. And they're trying to run a church. And so people get frustrated with you. They lose trust in you because you're not planning far enough ahead, which shows a lack of competency. And then you ask for trust and wonder why people aren't returning your phone calls. And so it's really important to think through the relationships you have <laughs> with respect to trust in the context of communicating. We have to do it as a team. 
how I have to think through how we're treating people, what our motives are, make sure we're skilling up to grow in our competence, make sure that we're correcting any behaviors that would lead to a, show a lack of character. And we have to choose what kind of a track record we want to build with the people we're communicating with or in relationship with or in a team with. It's really, really important. So information is not at the core of communication. Trust is at the core of communication. So if you're blowing it, intentionally build it back. Find out where the weak links are and deal with it. That's great leadership and great leadership is required for great communication. Let's talk about number two. Announcing information or ideas to as many people as you can, <laughs> as fast as you can, all at once. I am guilty as the day is long for doing it. When I first discovered Twitter, we'd have a great leadership team meeting. Myself and the pastor would be so excited about some of the decisions. We'd take a picture, we'd get on our phone, and we tweet it out to the whole world, just in sheer joy and excitement for what God was doing and what was coming. That was a terrible idea. Because people would be so mad at us because we would tell everybody at the same time. And so just picture this. Let's say you're a head of, uh, I don't know, baptismal ministry. And we just say, hey, we're going to be doing baptisms different. We're so excited. And three new people coming on. And it's going to be the best year for baptisms ever. And the person on the baptismal team seeing this text and somebody asked them, hey, Mark, I understand baptisms changing. That's really exciting. What exactly is happening? I don't know what's happening. What do you mean you don't know? You're the leader of the baptismal team. I know, uh, but so-and-so never talked to, talk to me about it. And so we can often set people up for failure, us especially as leaders, if we're trying to communicate everything all at once. It's not health. We have to think through our structure. And we have to treat our most important people, the people that are in leadership, our staff, our key leaders, we have to treat them like they are the most important people. And we have to communicate big ideas to them first, to win them over, not just to the what and the how. Here's what we're going to do, and here's how we're going to do it. Those are issues of management. But it's also about the where are we trying to go with this change, and why is it so important? You see, the where and the why are leadership issues. And communicating that effectively is what wins people over to the vision for the change. Everything requires a vision, just a vision statement for your church. Every change you make, every ministry you have requires vision. We need to communicate vision to our key people so that when we do start communicating it further and further down the line in terms of our organization, we have people who are leadership, sorry, who are vision carriers within the organization. So when there's misunderstandings, there are other people there to fill in the gap with the right information and kind of stamp out misunderstandings early. But when you do what I did, just fire it out on Twitter, or if you're a priest or a, or a bishop and you just say it to everybody all at once, surprise, here's where I'm thinking of taking this over the next little while. It's actually really hurtful. It doesn't show you care at all because you didn't talk to me and you say I'm one of the most important people and your mentor, I structurally, organizationally, might have a really important role in the organization, but you're not bringing me along. You're just springing it on everybody and then I'm supposed to have your back. How can I have your back? You haven't given me the opportunity to have your back because I don't know what the heck you're thinking. So don't do it. And if you have done it, if that's your track record, stop and apologize for it. It's hurtful. Why are you doing that? Stop it. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for uh, a second chance and start making decisions with your leadership team, bringing them along and all the other forms of leadership Work through that cascade of communication, through your organizational structure, to win people over to the vision behind the where and the why, behind the what and the how. And that is going to lead to far better communication because it will be done through relationships of trust, not just the best ideas. The best ideas do not win the day if they're not seeded through relationships of trust. When you think about that, if you're in leadership, I want you to pray about that and allow the Holy Spirit, invite the Holy Spirit to convict you of ways that you've disengaged people 
by not properly using the leadership structure that you've inherited or that you've built. By getting too excited and just sharing ideas around people, then ask your key people questions, they can't have your back. That's on you. I hope you take that to heart. Here's number three. Once you've communicated something, you're done. Uh, again, the bigger the idea, the bigger the change, the more intentional you have to be with facilitating that change. We have to scale it back and think through all the different players. Again, it's a lot like this organizational structure and the cascade of communication. Who is this announcement, this idea, or this change going to impact? Who do we have to bring into those conversations to talk about the where and the why? So that we'll, together we can work through the what and the how. So that as we communicate things, we communicate them again and again. In fact, if you're doing, you're a priest, you're going to want to, if it's a huge change to how you do sacramental ministry, for example, you're probably going to want to do a preaching series. Just do it once, but multiple times. Talk about it from different angles, from the angle of a teacher, from the angle of a student, from the angle of a parent, from the angle of you as the, the priest leader, uh, from the angle of being a disciple and trying to, to help empower people to live a life worthy of glory of heaven. And so, so there's different things that you can do and ways that you can pack something. And so the bigger it is, the more you need to communicate it. Uh, for churches, for example, we would often talk about things at the leadership team level. Then we talk about things at the all staff level so that people knew as a staff. Then we have leadership summits as another platform with which we would communicate things to our key leaders before we would ever get a Preaching series. That makes sense. You see the steps there. Reese and his team working things out, thinking things through, maybe even having a strategic meeting with people from the outside of the team if necessary, then bringing it to the staffs. The staff now are equipped, then to the leaders of the church, leadership summits that we'd have three times a year. And then only then maybe would it come to a G series. And that's if it's something, but you don't do that. Do you know what I'm saying? And I'd say the same thing with bishops. Sometimes, you know, bishops get frustrated because they don't have great relationships with the, the presbytery. And, and so what they do is they'll often take their opportunity at events, gatherings, whether it's in someone's parish or it's a regional gathering, and they'll announce something, they'll say something, they'll pitch vision, but they haven't brought the priest. And part of the reasons, because maybe they're frustrated with the priest or the priests are frustrated with them because there's a lack of trust. So we try to go around them to the end user. It's not helpful. It's actually a terrible strategy. If your trust with your key people is broken, go back to building trust. Don't try to communicate around them or lead around your leaders. It's not helpful. Um, and again, it causes pain. And if you want to get communication right, that's not the strategy. You have to deal with the pain and maybe the track record that we have or that we've inherited. It's caused us these broken relationships. Makes sense. The other one is if people complain, we must be doing it wrong. People are always going to complain. Uh, if people aren't complaining, I'm wondering if there's anybody even listening. People complain. The key is who's complaining. It's a really good book called Growing an Engaged Church. Gallup put it out a while back. Actually, a Catholic edition. It talks about three groups of people. And this is in business. This is in a ministry. This is in a parish. This is in a presbyterate. This is in the, the, the country of bishops. It's all the same. There's three types of people. There's engaged, disengaged, and actively disengaged. So who are your engaged? They're your fans. They're the people that are all in. They don't have any hangups. They're filled with joy. They're often very excited. They have a deep level of trust. And if you're going somewhere, they're coming with you. They have your back. They're the people that make whatever we're doing in ministry so much fun. We just want to clone those people. <laughs> We're going to multiply people who are engaged because they really do have your back. They're all in. They're heavily engaged in the mission, whatever that mission is defined by you. And they're just wonderful people. Your disengaged people are great people as well. They're, they're very happy. They're just not doing anything. You know, I joke sometimes, you know, you run into somebody, hey, do you go to church? Yeah, I go to church. What church do you go to? I go to the one down the road. Yeah, who's the priest there? I don't know. Oh, is that Father uh, Father Matthews? Uh, 
yeah, that, that sounds right. Uh, how do you like it there? Oh, it's a great church. I love it. <laughs> so they're not engaged. They, they're not in any ministries. They're not doing anything. They don't even know any of the people that go there. They don't go there very often, but they're very content and very happy. But they're just not particularly engaged. They're not. They're in the boat, but they're not rowing, <laughs> so to speak. And so if the engaged are in the boat, they have an oar, they know what success looks like, they're listening to you, and they're rowing together to win. The people who are disengaged are happy to be there. They're sitting in the boat. They're looking around saying, what a great day. I should be taking some pictures. Put this on my Instagram. But they don't have an oar in their hand. The actively disengaged are in the boat as well. But when you're not looking, they're rowing the other way. They're the people who are actually undermining the very things that you're trying to do. They say they want to win. Uh, when you're watching, they're rowing and pretending they're working hard. But behind your back, they don't trust you. They're actually seeding mistrust, and they're really harmful for organizations. And all three of those categories are in every church and every diocese and every presbyterate. And so it's normal behavior. But we have to figure out who's complaining. Because if it's somebody who's rowing backwards behind their back, no kidding, they're complaining. They're always complaining. They're always going to complain. No, I'm not saying you don't have to deal with those complaints, but don't get your knickers in a knot because they're complaining. They're in a space of complaining. They're hurt. Actually, whatever they're probably complaining about isn't the issue. There's probably something far deeper, far more significant in terms of pain and distrust. And you might want to spend a bit of time there, but if they insist on dragging you down, then don't waste all of your time dealing with complainers. It's a waste of time. You do way better use of your time investing in engaged people than people that just won't pull you down. It's okay to let them, give them some attention, invite them to health, have real conversations to get to the root of the issues. But if they're not willing to do that, or if they're so broken, they can't, you're going to have to make a conscious decision to ignore those complaints. That makes sense. Again, Spike to Wendell's areas, you're going, no, I can't do that. Mm, okay, you, you guys make your decisions. Um, if they're disengaged people and they're complaining about, or sorry, if they're engaged people that are complaining about uh, communication, well, they're not engaged anyway. <laughs> but you could throw all the information in the world out there and they're not going to hear any of it because they're not engaged. <laughs> So, so they only want the information when they want it and they want it at their fingertips. They probably don't know the platforms you use for communication and that's on you. Have clear platforms that you use and use them regularly and train your people where to go to get the information. Um, but if they're, if they're engaged people, I'm oh, sorry, if they're disengaged people, so engaged, disengaged, and actively disengaged. So if they're in that middle group, which is the disengaged, I'm sorry, those people you're never going to be able to please them with information because they're just not that engaged anyway. So their expectations are unrealistic and don't let them put them up. And the third category is the engaged. So those are your biggest fans. Those are the people that are all in it. They're complaining. You're going to want to pay attention because they have your best interests in mind. So don't not listen. No, I'm not saying you don't listen to anybody, but listen differently. You need to be able to differentiate as a leader. Not everybody's the same. So don't treat everybody the same. Understand what category they fall into. And don't, if you spend your time always trying to please the actively disengaged, you're going to lose your engaged because you're spending your time on the wrong things. You need to invest disproportionately in the people that it's God's given you to move your mission forward. You know, remember the parable of the talents? The landowner was going, well, I'm going to give you one, you two, and you five, and I expect you to invest it. And then he comes back and five is 10, way to go. Four, two is four. That's fantastic. And one is still one. He didn't have much to say about that. Not a lot of good things. He didn't give that one coin to the person with four, did he? He gave it to the person with 10. God knows how to invest in places where he'll get a disproportionate return on us. As, as leaders, we have to do the same thing. And so responding to people's complaints takes time. And time is one of your richest assets and how you spend that time matters. And if you're spending it in the actively disengaged people and not the engaged people, you're going in the wrong direction. Just because people are complaining doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. Your communication strategy needs to be clear. You need to train all your engaged people on where to go. <laughs> train, your, train everybody where to go 
but help the engaged get it so they can help other people and just be consistent. All right. Communication belongs to a person or a department. Well, that's an easy way to think. And often people do. It's like youth ministry, actually. Oh, we need youth ministry. We just need to hire somebody. And they have no idea how youth ministry fits in to the mission of the church and the support required to be successful. They just blame the person that we don't have enough youth. Communications is almost identical. Just blame it on people. And they think, hey, you know what, if we have enough uh, social media, then it's going to be great. I would say social media is going to cover off maybe 5 or 10% of your communication. It's not near as effective as you think it is. You need to discern what platforms you're going to use and train people to go to those platforms. You should have a website that's constantly up to date. That's on you. Um, I know at our parish at St. Benedict, we have a, a monthly newsletter that we put out. And there's a lot of great stories that show care, that show transform life. It's not just a bunch of information. And then we also, once a week, they send out five points that people will want to know just to keep it brief because much information is helpful. It doesn't mean we don't have social media, but social media isn't what you think it is. <laughs> terms of an answer to your communication. So it belongs to a person or department. So here's the other thing I want to say about that. Every time a ministry or a leadership team thinks through some issues and solves them and made decisions and the decision's over, the question we need to ask ourselves is who does what, by when, and who needs to know. And that who needs to know is the communication piece. And everybody needs to take responsibility from thinking through, based on this decision, based on the impact and the influence of this decision, who's going to need to know and what, who's going to be responsible for letting them know, for communicating those things. Again, it can't just be a department. Communication has to run through our entire organization and it has to be done through the lens of relationships and maintaining trust. Because trust is the, the framework, it's the foundation of healthy cultures. That's all I need. So don't put that on a department. We all need to be responsible for communication and the impact our decisions have on them. You get? Okay. Here's the last one. The leader is responsible for all communication. Now, so many churches I see this. A father asks for Volunteers, volunteers come. Father asks for people to donate to something, they'll donate. And so everything gets put on father and then the staff to tell father to tell you know, to make these announcements. And it's it's just not a sustainable strategy, specifically if you're a church that's going on mission. You can do better. We can do better. And so think about it. You have to train your leaders, and most churches don't. So hopefully you do. Train your leaders in terms of what are the different types of communication. What are the different platforms and who are the different audiences? Break down communication from one big blob and, and decipher it. Break it down. You know, if it's if you're communicating to the people in your ministry, we don't have to announce that. That could be an email. You have contact with the people in your ministry. Communicate to them. You know, if they're, you're going to be doing some training. Um, communicate through email. Now, if you're going to be bringing on new members and you're going to do a new member drive or something like that, maybe you're mobilizing your people and working with the structure in the church. You find a time and a place where that might be appropriate to try to connect with new people. There's lots of different ways that we can mobilize people to recruit. Best people to recruit are the people in your ministry. We can't always be lumping everything on Father for him to cue communicate because then that's just too much. Every time we ask the congregation for something, that's an emotional withdrawal in that relational bank. And so we have to be careful how many asks we have, whether it's second collections, whether it's signing up for a food drive, whether it's signing up for a ministry. Every time we do that, it's a withdrawal and it's okay. But we have to be really good at depositing emotionally and relationally more into people than the withdrawals. And so when it comes to communication, there are all types of forms of communication. And really what we need to figure out is what's your vision for your ministry? Where are you going? Why is that important? And what are you going to do to get there? And how are you going to do it? You need to work with the people within your organizational structure to help them with that. And within that, 
they need a strategy for communication. And so they can think about where they're going to go in terms of setting goals and overlay on top of that their communication strategy. So these are ways that we can start thinking differently about communication versus lumping everything on father. That is often not the best strategy, and it's certainly not sustainable. All right, there it is. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. I hear about poor communication all the time, and I hear it through the lens of we're doing something wrong because people are complaining. Who's complaining? And do you have clear platforms that you're using for communication? And are you keeping them up to date and using them consistently? If you are and you still get complaints, welcome to life. It's normal. It's okay. Complaining people, I expect them. You should expect them too. But don't blame it on other people or assume that you have to run around and go solve their complaint. You do not help the, ask them to help you learn how to connect into platforms that we currently have. Again, information is not at the heart of communication. Relationships are. Trust is. Well, understand those five pillars of trust. See where it's broken. If you have a team member on your team that's not functioning a healthy way in those five areas, deal with it because they're causing a breakdown in your communication through being a person that others can't trust, that's not cool. And so if that's you, apologize. If it's somebody else, hold them accountable to it so that together we can be trustworthy, which will help us connect better with people, which will help communications far more than you can imagine, way more than hiring a social media person and just blitzing the whole internet with the information you have. When you do announce changes, yes, Make sure you're doing it through your cascade of communication, your organization structure, bringing on board the people who are closest to you and have the biggest influence. Do not go straight to the end user. Give yourself a high five and tell yourself how great a job you did. You've probably just disengaged all kinds of people. That's on you. Stop doing that. You can do much better. Think it through. The bigger the issue, the bigger the problem, the bigger the idea, the more time you have to take to plan efficiently how you're going to facilitate that change in the communication. When you communicate, you have to communicate bigger it is from all kinds of different angles, from different ways. Sometimes preaching series and so on can be helpful or using your newsletter to come around that concept, maybe for the whole month, whatever it is, make sure that you think it through. Don't just communicate something once and think you're done. Be creative. Communication doesn't just follow one person or one department. So go easy on your communication people. Again, build trust with them. Help them build trust with the other departments so that you can use the platforms you have consistently and then train other people. Connect into that information. And teach your people. Teach your people how the different ways of communicating the different audiences and help them develop a communication plan for their specific ministry. I hope those six tips are helpful. Well, this conversation is helpful. I want to learn from you. If I've said some things that you think are absolutely crazy or could have been said better, please help because you help me better. And communication is an issue so many of us face. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for doing everything you can build incredible cultures where trust is valued and communication flourishes. We focus disproportionately on the engaged people versus the actively disengaged people. Maybe I'll talk to you more about that. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, please take the time to, to share uh, any comments. I just learned this the other day. It tells you how much I know about communication. Every time you comment, like, share, it throws the algorithms in terms of its value, getting these conversations out further. So I would really appreciate that. <laughs> share, favorite, um, like, whatever it looks like. I'm so grateful for you. Thanks for what you do to make your church a better place. See you next time. I want to encourage you, as you lead this week, be faithful to God and generous to others. See you next time, and remember, if you're still breathing, you are powered for impact.